everybody. Hi there, I'm Jeff Glass. Um, I use he, him pronouns. So now we're going to uh, see a short video um, about the future we're working for and we're organizing towards. Sound issue. Yeah, there's also a remote. Um, um, is there a way to do it over there? Maybe, I don't know. There's physical boxes aren't that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. First started making this commute. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. Children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it, but people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create debt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing, and it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking, but there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything how we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. 
the only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remember as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II, we knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The way it began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and the Senate, and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves for the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit southern Florida, Parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, writing that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step is just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see.
there's something inspiring in that as a result. I love that it, that it kind of showed you a vision of the future because I think for a lot of people it's like being able to see it. And if you can't see it, how do you create it? And so I think it's 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 great to be able to see that future. I hope that's the reality. I really like that it incorporated air work and vehicles that that's usually not featured in the Supreme Court. As a part of like Medicare for All, so. Um, and when she talks about the potential for something like Hurricane Sheldon in Miami to go under, we have to start now. It's not something we can put off any longer. So do you. <coughs> Anyone else? Uh, you did a job planning mangroves in the country of Maine, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan. I'm going to be speaking on cancer. Um, so Dr. Benjamin, you know, she's a geneticist whose approach to research requires science, scientific investigation to community engagement for results. She applies this science plus social justice model as an associate professor of biology and chair of math and science at Upton Tilton University and historically Black College here in Austin, Texas. Um, so Amanda co-created and directs HT's uh, STEM Research Scholars Program, which is in the last five years has provided over uh, 90 HT undergraduates with in-depth funded research experiences and uh, St. David's Foundation Scholars, which seeks to diversify health fields Amanda also led a NSF-funded redesign of HT's natural science curriculum and provides inquiry and research embedded into coursework. Her own research includes investigations of affordable housing impacts, urban wildlife as environmental capital, <coughs> uh, park health disparities. She is an executive director of the Austin Community Data Coalition, a nonprofit that organizes um, collaborations for community research and co-director of the Dumpster Project, a K-12 environmental learning program. Amanda co-created HT's new environmental justice major, co-founded and organized HT's annual Building Green Justice Forum, and mentored environmental students, uh, the environmental student group uh, Green is the New Black. She was recently selected as an American Association for the Advancement of Science as ambassador. Um, Amanda also serves on the City of Austin Zero Waste Commission, so it's my pleasure to introduce her. I'm going to start my timer <laughs> to make sure I don't ramble too long. Feel free to adjust the mic how you need it. Like, like this? Up and down, wherever. Can you all hear me? Yeah, that's yes. better. All right, I'm going to check. Um, hi, so I'm Amanda, uh, she pronouns, and I'm going to talk to you about two things. I'm going to give you a little bit of climate science, and I'm guessing that for some of you in the room, it's going to be old news, uh, so I'll try to read the room a little in terms of if I'm going over things you know, please stop me if you want more details on anything. And then I want to talk to you a little bit about environmental justice and how what we're seeing now with climate seems new and terrifying. But it's something that the, the, the forces behind the current climate crisis have been with us for a really long time and have been affecting lower income people and people of color for gosh, decades and decades. And so we can learn from that um, and apply that to what we need to do now. So the greenhouse effect, uh, like everything in the world, too much of a good thing becomes a bad thing without so the, the surface of the earth is warmed by the sun without an atmosphere. All of that heat would escape back into space and the surface of the planet would be zero degrees Fahrenheit, about 18 or 19 degrees under zero for Celsius, meaning the nature of life on the planet would be fundamentally different. Greenhouse gases, notably carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, 
they intercept that radiation as it's escaping back into space and redirected in all directions, including back towards the planet, which is what keeps us at a temperature suitable for life as it has evolved. The problem arises when we have more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We get more and more warming out of pace with what our ecosystems can handle at the moment. So this is probably a really familiar diagram to all of you. Right? This is the measurement of atmospheric carbon dioxide taken at an observatory in Hawaii um, for, well, since 1959. This is called the Keeley curve after the scientist who started making the measurements. Um, he is dead now, he died in 2005. His son is also a climate scientist at the Scripps Institute in California. And he began these measurements at this particular observatory in Hawaii because it was in an area of the world where much air could have mixed before being measured there. And it was at a height where they could take clean measurements without being affected by these little fluctuations about things that were happening on the surface. So this is about um, 3,400 3, uh, kilometers up. And you see the pattern, of course, increasing year after year after year. Those little zigzag lines are because there's an annual fluctuation of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide peaks in May because a warm planet with warm soil and warm Soil bacteria release CO2. Plants will then suck up extra CO2, and so you see a drop in September. So that's the little zigzag. This line is always a zigzag because it's a normal annual fluctuation. The star at 400 parts per million. Uh, we exceeded that briefly in 2013, consistently in 2016. That is a number that we had not exceeded in the previous 800,000 years on the planet. We know that with pretty good certainty from ice core data. If we use other methods like paleoclimatology, um, looking at fossil organisms, that 400 number is probably something we haven't seen for more like three and a half million years. So our carbon dioxide levels, because we're not even looking at methane here, has reached unprecedented levels. When you talk about the data for this, um, the data about what has happened in the past from these ice cores is very definitive. Okay? There are some things about the way that we might model what happens next, where there are uncertainties about how bad it's going to get, what the temperature rise is actually going to be, how much the sea levels are going to actually rise. A lot of that is making assumptions based on what we've seen in the past. But this part of it, these measurements are hard science. Pulling gas bubbles out of ice cores and analyzing the isotopes so that we know exactly how long ago it was and which carbon came from biological sources versus, versus which came from man-made sources. This is all pretty um, airtight. Didn't mean to make a bad <laughs> <laughs> and, and it is something that still comes up. Still, people who want to be skeptical will find a way to so this increasing carbon dioxide is increasing the average global temperature on the planet. This is air temperature. This is surface open ocean temperature. This is even alarmingly deep ocean temperature. So this graph is showing you the increase in temperature from the pre-industrial age. We're almost always, when you read this climate literature, comparing to the period 1850 to 1900 as pre-industrial. And then you're tracking how many degrees beyond that. So we have increased about a degree from pre-industrial levels so far, a degree Celsius, for the whole planet. And we're on trend to continue this. A few things about this graph, you can see that there's some averaging here. And that little, oh, I have a pointer. This dip <laughs> is another little point that climate skeptics will bring up. Well, if carbon dioxide was rising all this time, and te wouldn't temperature rise all this time too? Shouldn't this be more of a straight shot, this line here, because it's dip? Well, in this period, along with carbon dioxide, we were also pumping a lot of aerosols into the atmosphere, <coughs> namely sulfate. And sulfate is terrible for human health, but in the upper atmosphere, it reflects the energy of the sun back into space. 
So you will have a cooling effect from having sulfate, not all aerosols, some of them will increase temperature as well, in the upper atmosphere. So that little dip, that's more than likely what we're seeing. Our increase in temperature that is projected at the as of the latest IPCC report, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one and a half degrees Celsius. Remember, we're already about a degree there. So we're trying to do something about that last half of a degree Celsius between 2030 and 2052. That is a best case scenario. That is if we curve to zero carbon within this period by 2050. And there are assumptions in that document that I think we need to be really clear about when we talk about specific policies and what we would like to see versus what we might have to support to get there. So this is zero net carbon. It is not 100% fossil free, right? They're, they're looking at retaining something like in this, this transition period, 6% coal, 15% oil, something like that. 60% would be renewable energy. Um, Energy consumption would be either flat with carbon sequestration or nuclear, or you have to reduce energy consumption if you want to get by without doing any kind of carbon sequestration. And I know that that's a particular point of uh, discussion in our circles because there are different types of carbon sequestration technology and some of them are going to have big impacts, maybe some are not. It's um, Important that we know what we're talking about. It's a broad category of technologies that fit under that umbrella. Now, this is the IPCC, which tends to be conservative and has been conservative. And some of the predictions they've made about things like loss of glacial ice, it's already shown that they were looking at the lower end of what could happen. And we've already exceeded their predictions for time frame. So there are scientists who predict that this is going to happen faster, that this is going to happen um, in a more extreme way. There are also some who would predict that we are assuming a lot of graduality in these models that may not exist, and that there might be tipping points for things like the ocean that will cause large change in a small amount of time, which isn't built into this kind of prediction. Sounds great. Right? <laughs> yeah. You're in wonderful shape. So here's the thing. Um, this kind of information can be presented as, well, what are we going to do? Right? We, we should, it's already done. Are we going to be able to, to take care of this? I was talking to an eighth grade teacher today, and I asked her if her students were aware of climate and how they felt about it. And she said that they all thought they were due, that they all knew enough to know how bad it was. But what we just saw in that video, they're not there yet in terms of imagining how it could be different. So they pretty much took it for granted that their lives were going to be terrible, that they might as well just enjoy what they're doing now because everything was going to change in this horrifying way. I would remind you and remind them, maybe not with these words, that this is still a range of possibilities. And we do have to do everything we can to curb as much carbon as we can, because the amount of suffering and loss of human life that would occur between 1.5 or 1.6 or 1.7 or 1.75, those are very, very different. And everything we can do is going to help that rise be smaller, and it's going to mean that we're going to be able to come back from it in a shorter amount of time. CO2 takes thousands of years to normalize back. So anything we can do is going to help that. And just in the, as an example, this is from a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. Looking at the most recent, recent predictions, this is looking at your minimum nighttime temperature, uh, the, what the change would be in your minimum nighttime temperature. And look at, just look at the color bars on these two maps, right? So the modeling allows for both of these scenarios to still be in play. We want to make sure we stay here. And so action's important, even if these predictions seem as if we have no hope. We can work to make sure we are on the lower end of the range of what might happen. So here are some specifics 
Um, some of these were in the video. So we already talked about the warming, land, layer of the atmosphere closest to the earth, the troposphere, both levels of the ocean. The ocean is acidifying. The ocean carries carbon dioxide in a form called carbonic acid. It is kind of excitingly the same way we hold carbon dioxide in our blood. We have carbonic acid in our blood too. And the acidification of the ocean affects any organism that builds a shell. Um, so basically the bottom of your ocean food chains, those organisms are affected by this phenomenon, the corals uh, that someone mentioned earlier are affected by this phenomenon. We're losing ice, we're losing sea ice, we're losing glaciers. This affects sea level, this also affects the fresh water supply. Decrease in snow cover of the rising sea level, again, that's still we're incredibly important to think about mitigating that as much as possible. It's going to happen. What can we do to make sure it's one foot and not two or 20, right? Decrease in snow cover, that affects the amount of energy that we bounce back into space, right? Bright white snow shines that energy back. So as we lose snow, we have an acceleration of warming because the soil is absorbing more. More extreme weather, more floods, more fires, fires which affect air quality. Air quality which kills directly and indirectly. Particulates cause asthma and they cause heart attacks and they might have a role we think now in Alzheimer's disease. So there's a lot about air and health that is tied to global climate change. Loss of biodiversity, changes to our foods, nutrition, a plant, a particular plants that would be affected are like rice, wheat, and soybeans. If the plant is responsive to carbon dioxide, it might grow faster as CO2 goes up, but it will be less nutritious. There'll be less protein, less minerals in the plant. So you're gonna have kind of this low level malnutrition if, if, if we don't address this. And then infectious disease shifts, as a biologist by training, this one sort of fascinates and horrifies me. Um, where disease vector organisms like ticks and mosquitoes live is already shifting. We've seen this in the United States. We've seen this in some parts of Central America, Zika, for example. Um, so that's something that's gonna happen as the climate changes. This picture is um, that big Delaware piece of Antarctica cracking off, um, if anyone remembers that happening a few years ago. And at the time it was a record for loss of Antarctic ice, but we're at another one already. And then when it comes to how, how many people are affected, these numbers are sort of limited in scope. This first estimate that I put up there is from the World Health Organization, 250,000 deaths from climate change, but they were looking really specifically at flooding, malnutrition, dengue fever and malaria, so mosquito-borne disease, but only those two, and um, heat stress, so just elderly and children especially being affected by the high temperatures. And they came up with this 250,000 between 2030 and 2052. They're not accounting for a lot of things that we know are gonna happen, right? Displacement and the disruption of healthcare and services that can happen then. What happens to your water quality after an extreme weather event and the propensity for disease then? Loss of productivity, loss of air quality, again, leading to disease. So these numbers, are probably a little closer to what we can expect. 529 deaths just from shifts in food productivity. So that is malnutrition, loss of crops to extreme weather, um, displacement causing malnutrition, and then the accelerating factor of people being moved into extreme poverty by destruction of their homes and being displaced by climate crisis. Most of this even though this is an older map, um, it shows you where most of this would happen. We're talking definitely about islands and low-lying areas. We're talking about heat being concentrated in urban centers. But for most of the effects that were on that previous slide, we're looking at the global south. You're looking at Africa and South America and parts of South Asia. So this is the part that isn't new for anyone who knows about environmental justice, because the pattern of globally poor, less developed countries suffering for what we do as a whole planet 
has been with us for a long time. In the United States, the pattern of lower income black and brown communities bearing the burden of what we do collectively as we pollute, as we destroy the environment, has been with us for a long time. In the US, the, the kind of modern conception of the environmental justice movement began with some events that occurred in Warren County, North Carolina. Is anyone familiar with this story? Seeing a few, maybe? So what happened in Warren County was uh, a pair of contractors who was supposed to take care of PCB contaminated oil. PCB is a human carcinogen. It's a thyroid disruptor. It's a neurotoxin. It is a persistent organic pollutant. So this is something that <coughs> hangs around in soil and water. And also, if you get it in your body, it gets stored in your body fat and will hang around for 10 to 15 years. So bad stuff. Um, it is than now. But they were charged with disposing of this oil that had PCB in it. It was used as a coolant and for some other things. And instead of disposing of it, they dumped it along the side of the road, along these rural highways in North Carolina, about 31,000 gallons of it. And when this was discovered, um, the this North Carolina uh, Highway Department put up signs first and then collected all of the soil. So that 31,000 gallons of contaminated oil became 60,000 tons of contaminated soil that had to be dealt with, dug up from all of these highways and moved somewhere in a tomb or kept away from people. So that part sounds okay, except that North Carolina decided that where they would put this landfill to house all the PCB contaminated waste and seal it away was in Warren County a county that was 70% non-white, very poor, no representation, no power, and it wasn't even a good place in terms of geologic characteristics to put this kind of landfill. This sort of material needs to be put somewhere where there is no possibility of it getting into the groundwater. It has to be sealed in sort of a dry way. And when they consumed all of this, they included a lot of water. So within just a few months of creating this landfill, there was already contamination into groundwater at the wrong site. Now, people did protest this, and this got national attention. So this was one of the first times that in the United States, a group came together to protest a landfill. And they were protesting. They delayed it and delayed it and delayed it, and then it finally did get built after all became a contaminated site. And fast forward several years later, the whole time the landfill is leaching PCB into the surrounding soil and water, it becomes a super fun site and has to be cleaned up because it wasn't built properly. It wasn't built with the kind of collection system you would need to really protect this from spreading. But this was a galvanizing moment for people, especially civil rights leaders, who had seen this over and over again in their communities had seen this pattern of black and brown and poor living near contaminated sites, being subjected to the toxins produced by society at large. And that part of it maybe isn't quite so new in that there were threads of this even before Warren County occurred. Um, Cesar Chavez, right, a big arm of what he did was about pesticide exposure to agricultural workers. That's an environmental justice issue many, many threads in indigenous movements. Taking away someone's land is an environmental justice issue. And I don't want anyone to forget what Martin Luther King was protesting when he was killed in Memphis. Does anyone remember what this strike was about? Sanitation workers. Sanitation workers, environmental justice. So after Warren County, some of the groups that mobilized, again, were groups that had been active in civil rights, and black churches and uh, Chicano organizations were leading the way. One of the reports that came out very early was commissioned by the United Church of Christ, and they created a commission on racial equality and then uh, kind of recruited scientists, many scientists of color, to sort of catalog where these toxic waste sites were around the country and who was living near them. And so this report that came out talks 
toxic wastes and race showed half of indigenous people living near toxic waste sites, and then the 15 million African Americans and 8 million Hispanics. And so they were really active in trying to draw attention to the problem, draw attention to the environmental races, the pattern of certain people living near and being exposed to environmental contamination. This was a landmark study. The study wasn't enough. And despite the fact that they built awareness and many organizations were building awareness up to the point where we got representation in EPA, representation in state governments, 20 years later, they did toxic, toxic wastes and race at 20 to see what was the effect of bringing all this to light and trying to give communities tools for drawing attention to the work and the situation was even worse. So there might have been fewer facilities, but most of the people living within 1.8 miles of one of these toxic waste sites or landfill sites was a person of color. So the pattern continued. What we have today is more of the same. We have Flint. We now have areas of New Jersey with the same problem. Many more counties and cities that we know about probably have really similar situations to Flint. We're just not testing for them. So the access pipeline, right? Really recent example, again, of the same phenomenon. Those of us who have the fewest resources, the least power, suffering the environmental impacts of our society. And this is a national problem. It's not just little pick a site here, pick a site there. This map is from a paper looking at air pollution. And it's looking at areas where basically the people who suffer the most impact from air pollution are lower income whites and black and brown because most air pollution is either from one of those chemical sites or if you meet, live close to a highway. If you live close to a highway, there are particulates, there's nitrogen dioxide, and that is mostly going to be people of color. So the pattern that they found in this paper, the most exposure is for low income, black and brown, the least exposure, highest income white. So no real surprises there. Now, one of the things that we talk about in the environmental justice movement is, okay, so who's to blame for this? this is, horrifying and repeated pattern of the same kind of abuse over and over. Our ideal might be that everyone should have the benefits of a clean environment, but the reality is that we're seeing over and over and over again that the few are suffering, that the ones with the least power are suffering, the black and the brown are suffering from these environmental impacts. And it can be tempting to simplify who's to blame. So in the climate movement, for example, it's pretty easy to identify which companies are to blame. Right? This came out last year, I think. Um, there's been a couple of studies that look at how, which industries are the most polluting and then which companies in those industries. And if you look at who it is, it's not that many. Uh, this paper in The Guardian showed 20 companies responsible for 35% of our carbon dioxide, 20 companies all oil and gas, of course, and that industry is eminently responsible for what's going on. And it's not just them, right? It would be easy if we could, as people who care about this, as good actors in this space, point to these companies and say, we're gonna divest and shut them down, and they're the ones doing all of this. But it's more complicated than that because we collectively, as societies, are part of it too. And it's sometimes all of us. Right? Do you eat meat or dairy? Agriculture, animal agriculture, specific, specifically cows, chicken, and dairy, are on track to be a larger contributor than the fossil fuel industry. Because methane, methane, less methane has more of a punch than carbon dioxide. So this is a, a shared responsibility we all have, a shared way that we're contributing to the problem. And it's harder to talk about, I think, these sorts of changes. Um, this uh, science, I think, was the journal that had the study on if we all went vegan, how could we affect climate? 
and it's a significant impact because these are industries that globally produce a lot of fossil fuel. So what can we learn from environmental justice and from the lessons of these generations of people who have been engaged in the fight? One of the core sets of principles, and I'm wondering if these are familiar to anyone here? Yes, maybe, no? Yes, great. Okay, so this is kind of a core set of organizing principles for environmental justice. It arose from a meeting organized by the Southwest, Net Southwest Network for Environmental and Economic Justice. And they had a meeting in New Mexico, and so they're the Jemez principles because that's where they had the meeting. And this is what they boiled everything down to, just these six principles for how you can equitably solve environmental issues, economic issues too. They were really looking at globalization and the environmental and economic pressures of globalization. So be inclusive, bottom-up organizing, let people speak for themselves, particularly the impacted people. Emphasis on solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships among ourselves, commit to self-transformation. They seem simple, but there's a lot packed into each of these ideas. When I'm talking to environmental groups, um, particularly very conservative uh, environmental groups that are really focused on maybe like land conservation. You just want to set aside pristine things and not really think so much about the people that might be impacted. I boil it down even more. And this is what I tell them. Is your organi organization or process diverse? Look around the room. If everyone you see looks like you, racially, ethnically, in religious tradition, economically, disability status, you have a problem. And that's what you need to address before you do anything else. If you're working in an environmental space, you have to be including the people that are impacted by the problem. And it is a dodge to say we're all impacted. Some people are going to be impacted more. You need to talk to them and make them part of your process. At the same time, including those people in your room does not mean that they have to represent everything about race or about inclusion of other religions or about gender inclusion. They are there and everyone in your organization, everyone needs to be aware of those bigger issues, racism, patriarchy, gender discrimination. Okay. And be knowledgeable about how to address solutions for those issues because those issues are the ones that made the environmental issue take the form that it did. And on a project level, if your project does not advance equity, it doesn't belong at the place. And that's again, every project, even something simple, like doing outreach or designing a poster. Last one, I promise. Just a reminder, we are in Texas and Texas is majority minority. So Texas has gone the way the nation will go in 2043. But Texas, we're in the middle of a shift too. <coughs> Texas is gonna be majority Hispanic in very short order, right? So there's the, this slide here is non-Hispanic white, and there's the white population. African-American is staying pretty flat. So something to consider as you think about building movements, building coalitions, building that mutuality and solidarity is thinking about who you're including in your efforts. A lot of this is what we do at HT. We have, a, we're a historically black college or university. We have about 68% African American, a growing Hispanic population, 28%. We actually qualify as a Hispanic serving institution in addition to being an HBCU, historically black. Most of our students are first generation college students. Most are low income. They're on federal aid, not just federal aid, but Pell Grants, the highest need category. And yet despite this, and despite the pressures of being an HBCU and being in families and from families that have, are navigating a lot of economic strife, um, we have students that are really engaged in this work and in addressing the environment and they care about it. And I think you will find that, you mentioned youth, I think you're gonna find that with youth of color, with youth from low income backgrounds, anywhere you go. Because they understand very intimately how anything that affects their community is gonna affect them. And that's all I've got. Thank you. Yes, sir.
last Friday, I talked about equity and projects that advance equity go forward. But there's so many ways to measure equity, like it's all about the line. And so can you talk a bit about more like the types of equity and like how you balance, because sometimes the strengths and weaknesses of projects that I'd love to move forward, but we have to. That's a good, so it is important not just to use like a demographic tally as equity. I mean, that's one measure. If we were looking at an organization or a project, you would want to see who are the participants and then who are the beneficiaries and look at, I would say, your demographics on both of those sides. So maybe your core team is not diverse, but you're engaging with participants, a broader community that's going to be the beneficiaries, and that's where you have made a plan to be inclusive and diverse and who benefits from the program. Does that make sense? Yeah. The other thing I would say is that organizationally, having a diversity plan and some sort of equity practice helps a lot. So documenting what you, what your vision for diversity and equity and inclusion is, and then how you yourself are measuring those things. What do you say, a diversity plan? And a d diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. And so it's sort of you state a goal for what you would like to see in your organization and in your projects, and then that way you can devise metrics that make sense for your organization. If you're an organization of two, maybe the core team isn't diverse, but you can look at who your partners are, who you're communicating with, who's going to benefit from your programs, and look at equity from that lens. So we're going to try to, we're going to have breakouts in a bit, I'm sure everybody has questions, but we're going to be able to discuss anything we want in those breakouts, although we have topics. And so we're going to move, move along from this, and then we're going to come back and do some more discussion. So thanks, Dr. Using mic as well. Hi, everybody. If you if I haven't met you, my name is Kimberella Bruxton. I'm, I'm the co chair of Austin DSA. Um, so I'm here to introduce someone who's very important and special to me. Um, so I wrote a thing. Uh, <laughs> to make a Green New Deal a reality, it's going to take a lot of things, right? Um, but one of those things is our elected officials are going to have need to have some courage, especially here in Texas where there's no shortage of oil money to line pockets. We've become accustomed to elected officials who get rich and ignore all the hard signs that we just talked about. I'm here to introduce Heidi Sloan, a candidate for Congress in Texas 25th District, a candidate who has always shown great courage. Uh, in the face of city council that paid sick and the defense of our neighbors experiencing homelessness and on so many other occasions, I've had the pleasure of standing in solidarity with Heidi, fighting with courage and conviction that justice for the many is only possible when we stand together. She's running on all the goods, y'all. Medicare for all, free child care for all, with good paying jobs for care workers, housing for all, but today she's here to talk with us about the Green New Deal, how it will fundamentally change our world to be sustainable for the future. I'm really excited to hear Heidi talk about all this, so let me get out of the way and introduce a woman I, who has so much courage that I want to be her when I grow up, Heidi Sloan. Oh. about where we are and where we need to be and then ask ourselves how in the world are we going to get there we have to go through that moment of honesty and vulnerability first and it is good to be in that moment here with you and it, with many of you in so many organizing spaces the easiest way for me to talk about how we are going to accomplish a green new deal that addresses both the climate crisis which is enormous and sometimes overwhelming in itself. The highest carbon levels in 3.5 million years is all. Um, and also <laughs> compoundingly climate justice at the same time. Um, those are huge, huge issues. Sometimes we look at them and we just say, I don't, 
I don't know. I don't have hope. I am here and I'm stuck and I'm going to close myself off from that. That doesn't get us anywhere. And so we have to have an organizing conversation with ourselves. And that's what I'm going to do today. Organizing conversations help me to work through problems, especially when I'm trying to understand my relationship to power in those problems, right? So we know what we want. We have our demand. We want to account for climate crisis in our climate justice work. We want to build an economy that works for all of us and that is sustainable, that sustains our ability to live on this planet. No biggie. <laughs> Fortunately, I think the key to the one is, is wrapped up in the other. I think the key to the climate crisis is actually wrapped up in climate justice, right? And we have this incredible document from the ICPP. It's like the most intersectional piece of science that I've ever seen in my life. Please read it. It's worth the time. Uh, it's not, it's actually not that hard to read their reports that they send out every couple of years. But we have this analysis and it talks about things like education and healthcare and access to water and women's roles in society and housing and these being the core issues that can help us to account for climate crisis, which is lucky for us because it does just about everything except for point to the capitalist system, the propping up of the oil and gas industry and all of their imperialism and all of their oppression, it does everything short of say, divest, take power back from these kings of economy. It does everything short of that. It, it just implies that we have to move power back into the hands of the people. It just implies democratic control of how we live, of how we produce, of how we relate to one another, of how we plan for the future. And I think that that's really fortunate for us because the next step in having an organizing conversation, once we know what we want, is to ask who can give it to us. And I think that the analysis is great. Sometimes we want to say that the barons of the oil and gas industry are the only ones that can give us the Green New Deal. And I actually want to flip that on its head and say that we are the ones who can give ourselves the hope for a future that is for all of us. But that's going to take some work. So what is our strategy if our if our um, primary mechanism for power is ourselves. What is our strategy? If we looked at a power map, if we looked at all of the people, see we're having an organizing conversation here. <laughs> if we looked at all of the, the key players in the climate crisis and in climate justice, we would all be there somewhere. Some of us would feel very strongly about the issue in one direction or another. Some of us would have access to more power and some to less power, but we, in this conversation, because our goal is actually democratic control, is actually power in the hands of the people, we have to account for everyone. Our power map gets huge. And so in our organizing, we have to set a huge table. And it has to be a table that is first and foremost anti-imperialist, anti-racist, and class conscious, conscious, because we know that on our power map, there are people who feel things very strongly and who have very little power. And we need those allies to move up the scale of power. We need those allies to move toward the center of being safe, of having a hope and a future. So in our organizing, as we talk to one another, we actually have to know that our deeper strategy of democracy is going to come through tactics that build shared power, that build leadership 
amongst the groups who tend to be marginalized, have less power, and feel more affected, right? To be centering people now and as we go forward in our conversations, knowing that not only do we not get a policy if we're not all on board with this, if we're not reaching out to all of our neighbors who maybe are thinking, will a Green New Deal cost me my job? Will a Green New Deal make my food more expensive or my gas more expensive? We have to organize for the policy, but we also have to organize remembering that our neighbors who tend to be most affected and also have less power, which the vast majority of us have, have less power in this situation right now, but, but that those neighbors are also the key to a just transition for all of us. The phrase just transition is often used to apply to jobs when we're talking about changing whole industries, right? that people who are displaced from an industry will find a place in a new job and that wages will be comparable and benefits will be comparable. I think that we actually have to talk about a just transition of our whole society because if we're going to tell each other the truth in our organizing with the hope to accomplish policy, we have to make sure that we're not just setting a table that says these are our demands for a Green New Deal, but that we are setting a table that we say, this is our role, my role and your role and each of our role going forward as we enact a Green New Deal. That's a just transition and it is our, it is our personal behaviors, it is our voting, it is our industry and our work and our organizing. It is all of it. We have to be honest and have those conversations about a just transition. But within that power map of individuals who are more or less affected, and in that power map of individuals with more or less power, what we can also be doing is building coalitions, right? Building organizations. So that those of us who are geographically connected, those of us who are connected by industry, those of us who are connected by the way we are impacted, et cetera, by our jobs, by our schools, by our healthcare, by our faith groups, whatever organizing space is available to us, that we can be moving whole groups of people around our power map in a way that is intersectional and that brings whole groups into enduring power into democratic access and governance over our future. When we talk about this power map of coalition, this way of organizing that brings us in connection with our neighbors in a variety of different senses, those, all of those different organizations have to be moving in the same direction. If one of us, one of our groups is over here and working on one tactic or strategy, and then another group is working in a different direction and they're not communicating, we're in trouble. We all have to be headed toward one policy that works for all of us. And so we are setting a table, again, that is huge. And we're setting it now as we're writing policy and we're setting it for the future as we're enacting policy, as we are changing, as we are providing a just transition that requires us to make personal decisions, that requires our jobs to be organizable, that it requires our jobs to be care filled, that requires our jobs to be uh, providing a future that is for all of us. So we are building coalition and we are bringing together people through imagination through our hope, through our ability to do what that video of AOC's did earlier, to create a shared purpose, to create shared power, to say that we have to all be moving in the same direction is to say that we have a vision for that direction. It is not just a better world, it is a world that provides for our food and our water and our housing. It is a world where we are not sitting in traffic, but at home with our families. And this is where organizing gets really interesting, right? Because 
we are not just our roles, we are also the, um, the everyday human behaviors that we inhabit. And so as we are expanding our power map, building coalitions, bringing new people in, and working towards a common interest, we have to have this vision. Because it can't just be us, y'all. And it is a vision for a future where when I go and talk to people, when I'm canvassing, when you're canvassing, when you're speaking about a Green New Deal, you can point to someone's walls and you can say that your home should endure climate change. You can point to someone's job and you, can, you, should, you should be able to say that your job is better for resolving the climate crisis, that your I-35 is changed by the climate crisis, that your relationship with your children is, is better because we are also resolving the climate crisis. So we are whole people in this vision for a future, working collectively, moving towards a shared vision, setting a table, that is at first and throughout intersectional to guarantee that democratic power is actually power that rests in the hands of the people, that democratic power is not being given just one choice from on high or two choices from on high, but that actually we're writing the policy together. It's our imaginations, our hope, and our work that will accomplish it at the end of the day. And if we're saying anything else to our neighbors, if we're giving any other answer, claiming that we have, I have what you need, I'm gonna be able to fix it. If we're not mentioning the fact that I'm absolutely gonna need you, if we're not mentioning the fact that your, the way that this is impacting you is as important as the way it is impacting me, then we are not actually going to be able to resolve climate crisis with climate justice. And we're going to be back on a loop where power goes to the top rather than being distributed to all of us, where I believe that we can make the best choices possible by listening and caring and centering our common and shared hope and our common and shared future. I hope that we can take that with us in our organizing efforts, that today in our conversations, no matter what group we are coming from, that we are doubling down on our investment to listen, that we are doubling down on our investment to bring people into a movement and to let people be, to not be um, afraid to say, I'm not sure what the next step is. I need you to take it with me, right? I'm really excited that you are all here I'm really excited to see where we go forward. Now I feel is a moment here in Texas where we decide whether we are operating in our own power or we are operating to build power together. Thanks so much, y'all.